If you follow what's going on in Dungeons and Dragons, I'm sure that by now you've heard about the interview with VentureBeat that Hasbro CEO Chris Cox did. He talked about AI a little bit, and that's making a lot of waves in our gaming community. Here are a few quotes from that interview, things that Chris Cox said. He said, we're doing some stuff around AI that's really interesting. As I said earlier, we're trying to do a new AI product experiment once every two to three months. So they're committed to it. Right. He said, uh, we did a virtual Ouija board around Halloween that was up for a couple of days. That was a lot of fun. We just did Trivial Pursuit Infinite for National Trivia Day. And he went on to say, after that particular quote, that it was making money. He was happy that it boosted uh, money. He was happy that it boosted income for those games. Who wouldn't be? Right. Sure. Yeah. And then he said, uh, you'll see more of how we're thinking about how we can integrate AI, how we can integrate digital with physical gaming over time. And then he also went on to say, I use AI in building out my D&D campaigns. He was talking about map generation and I think some maybe story ideas or character ideas, yeah. things that people already do with AI or yeah. really more accurately large language models and how they're used in D&D &D and right. whatever you call AI art, which is not really artificial intelligence. It's generative imitation based, mm -hmm. based on algorithms, really, if you want to get technical. And I always do. We can only guess at what he really has in mind, if anything specific, right, for Dungeons and Dragons and commercializing AI. He said that he used it in his game planning, sure. But he also said that AI is exciting for the company and that they want to merge the digital and physical. I think what he really means is make it mostly digital. We've talked about this in other videos. At this point, it's very clear that Hasbro is interested in making D&D &D ultimately a digital first product where they get subscription revenue, which sure is better for business than having a small number of enthusiasts compared to their other products buy a book once every five years or two or right, three books yeah. once every 10 years, whatever it works out to. Sure, that's not as attractive for a company of that size that needs or wants to make the kind of revenue that they want to make. This isn't good enough. Um, this is one of the kind of uh, logistical problems of having a company as large as Hasbro oversee something like a tabletop RPG game. <laughs> They got to figure out some way to make it make more money than tabletop RPG games normally make. Right. TSR and was never a huge company. Wizards was bigger, but now Wizards is Hasbro. Right. And a good way to do that is subscriptions and online. Sure. Sure. The downside of this, though, is what's this going to do for friendly local gaming stores? We can already buy these products digitally without setting foot into a store. Unless we are enthusiasts about hard copy like I am. Most people probably aren't going to be. And also, think about Amazon. Amazon's killing it too because it's one more thing that you can just get sent directly to your house. That's true. Yeah. But especially the digital first thing, it's another nail in the coffin of local game stores. Right, absolutely. At least in terms of role-playing games. Um, this is happening with board games now. Board games are becoming more about Kickstarters. Mm -hmm. um, I hear game stores talking about lowering and lowering and lowering their inventory of games that they sell, games they get through distributors, the whole hardcore board game world seems to be moving away from that. Another nail in the coffin of game stores. If you like to meet people in real space, and I don't have anything against remote uh, gaming over the internet. You know, I'm, I'm getting into it myself. I'm running games on Start Playing. But I, I would be more comfortable if they coexisted with game stores. Game stores are still a great place to go and meet other gamers. They're still one of the only ways you get into a community of people where you have a good chance of getting into an in-person game Fairly quickly. Yeah. Basically, the inclusion of an AI DM is another thing that eliminates the need to go looking for like-minded people to enjoy this game with you. So now you don't even have to go to the store to find players. Now you could be in this world where, hey, what if the other players are also AI? You can go solo game. Which, you know, for somebody that's always wanted to try D&D &D and they're scared to talk about it with their friends because they don't want to think they're a nerd, even though we all are nerds in one way or another. Uh, this could be an easy way for them to actually get started in the game, at least. Do you think people still feel that way, though? With the popularity of Baldur's Gate, the popularity of the game itself now, it's gone mainstream. Yeah, I think that over the last few years, uh, that's definitely become less of a concern. Uh, it's almost like people are, which I think it's a good thing, uh, wear their nerd badge, full, showing yeah. full pride. Right, right. Um, How much of a nerd are you now? Now it's a crit yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, but you know, there's still some people that if you think about high school that that jock that's a little afraid to maybe <laughs> say, "Oh, I actually like sci-fi yeah. and fantasy." Yeah, I mean, these people exist. I, I've known yeah, these fair, people, fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is a way for them to maybe feel it out and see if it's a thing that they actually enjoy without putting that's a true. lot of money into it. Or True. even somebody just in general that doesn't maybe have the hundreds of dollars uh, that it sometimes takes to get these books up front, up yeah. front uh, and uh, they can spend the twenty dollars that it'll be for a subscription or whatever it is uh, to try it out. True, the source books still don't come with a subscription. No, for sure. So uh, buy those and and I know that the SRD is free. Uh, right. You can figure out ways to play the game, uh, but there's the the social aspect that. Some people are uh, anxious and don't really That's also have a true. good time uh, being around a bunch of people in person. Uh, this would give them a way to try and do this and maybe feel it out. That's fair. Uh, and work their way into it. Uh, right. Yeah, it's possible that the whole thing that scares the pants out of me, which is people solo gaming a lot more and that becoming the norm and everyone becoming disconnected. Yeah, there there isn't possible upside to it. Yeah, absolutely. In the sense that if it if it expands the net or whatever metaphor you want. If it makes the tent bigger, <laughs> right? There's more people in the tent, the big tent approach right. to it. That could be one concern I have about it though, is that if this becomes the more typical experience that people have, then it could also lower expectations. And then there could be people who never discover the kind of magic that happens with a human mind the possibilities for imagination and role play. I cannot see an AI DM or an AI player doing what human players do in that fullest sense, the game at its best. Yeah. I think that's definitely a good point. Uh, I think that once we start getting into uh, a largely available AI DMs, you're not going to have the same quality that you would get from a person or at least the same level of surprise that would come from a person innovation yeah I'm say. uh Creative you're gonna innovation. have yeah you're gonna have uh pre-written stories that you're just playing out it's gonna be a lot like those text-based games back in the day where you could say you have the the game telling you hey you have these three options to go to do you go left right do you go further into mm-hmm. the forest choose your own adventure yeah by the way, uh, TSR did experiment with solo choose your own adventure style D and D books uh, in the eighties. I had a few; they were kind of fun. I do think that we're not too far from LLMs getting better than that. Yeah. I mean, I think they'll start where you're talking about, but I could see them moving pretty quickly to being able to think on their think on their feet in a certain sense better than a human, but maybe less compellingly with less interesting things mm-hmm. happening it'll be like a video game that responds to what you do right it, i mean it'll be a very much a, a sandboxy video game right that you're then instead of seeing the video necessarily you're playing this out that's how i think it'll yeah, happen in the imagination though with the continuing push for a virtual tabletop maybe it does become a lot more like a video game sure. uh there's and, that 3d tabletop yeah. they want to do that looks extremely video gamey yeah. to me yeah so not you, they want to do they are doing they are it. that's what i said they're yeah. pushing yeah yeah so it might turn into more of a video game and less of uh, a tabletop rpg in general and i think yeah. that's definitely a, a worry that's another thing about ai dms and players when we talk about convenience no scheduling conflict yep it's going to discourage people from getting together because it's hard enough to do that anyway yeah it might discourage people and we know that Real DMs, human DMs, will never fully go away. No, absolutely Because people not. are going to want that better experience or even just like, hey, i just rather play with a person. i just rather know it was a human being. <laughs> even that. Yeah. There will be a certain amount of people who still want that. But I think it's possible that that could become such a small niche that it's difficult for those of us who want that and really don't want the AI experience at all to find it. It's going to be more premium in every sense. It might cost more mm-hmm. if you get a paid DM. And even if you don't, it might be uh, some trouble finding people that want to game with you. It may turn that way for a period of time. Mm-hmm. But the feeling of being together with your group of friends around a table, rolling dice, maybe to have a few new drinks if you're over 21. Uh, <laughs> and, and just that. And you drink. 
Yeah, There's yeah. nothing wrong and with drinking without yeah. drinking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I didn't say what kind of drinks, I guess. I just, just alluded to being over 21. Traditionally, Mountain Dew would yeah, be exactly. the beverage of D&D. Anyway. Yeah, your, your gamer fuel. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but sitting around that table with your friends and social interaction is a large part of what the game is. Yeah. So I think that the virtual side, the AI side, might end up being a way for people that are really into Dungeons & Dragons to get that quick hit yeah uh until your next session right uh but i don't think that in person games are gonna go away i think that there's just some draw to it that makes that always better even if the level of dming is sometimes inferior to what you might get with the ai i'm not looking at you dave <laughs> uh, i can't imagine it i i Maybe I'm just super biased. I can't imagine with what we have now, with the LLMs we have now, that any AI DM is going to be better than an, the average of the quality of a well, human I'm DM. More inexperienced DMs. Uh, yeah, that might that, be better than like yeah. your your, your first nephew time DM who's, that's never done it before. <laughs> like, that, yeah. Your 12 year old nephew saying. who just bought the DMG and just yeah. wants someone to play a game with him. Or, which to your point, you would do anyway because it's your nephew. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm talking more, you sometimes have your problem DMs as much as you have your problem players. Right. Uh, so sometimes I, that's what I would call the inferior DM. <laughs> oh, like a toxic DM. Yeah, a toxic DM. I think it's true that there will always be some kind of draw for in person games. I think that's true. I still think. What if, though, this gets everyone so persnickety that in a similar way, people are generally going to text first now, even when, frankly, sometimes a voice call is better. Sometimes a conversation is better in person, and that will always have that draw. And yet, as a society, we're pulling away from it because it's also intimidating. It's scary to have certain conversations with people in person, even if they might come out better in person. Mm. So we tend to avoid it. I don't like to call restaurants and ask questions anymore. Oh, I hate it. I, but I'm going to get better ordering answers. food <laughs> Me over too. the phone. Like, I don't, oh, yeah. online is easier. Give me a robot, yeah. right? Even though sometimes it's the same amount of time as picking up the phone, talking to the person. Oh, sometimes it's longer. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's longer going through this multi-step checkout yeah. process. And the experience is even inferior, but I will still avoid... There's always some low level of intimidation. I don't want a person to judge me for the pizza I'm ordering. I don't want, I mean, what are they going to think? Like, we don't do that consciously, but on some level, we just like to avoid that thing and let the robot do it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's also part of the reason that I haven't DM'd a game yet is that I'm afraid that all of my friends are going to judge me for being really bad at DMing, even though I know that that's just an internal mm -hmm. They'll also fear. judge you if you're good. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, people be criticizing. Yeah. But I think that's also just part of, life that you have to get over uh, and i'm also they? not one of those people for me mm. i'm not the person that's afraid to go make th that call or see that person in in, in person to talk about things i prefer okay. that okay uh, so for me i can't really relate to that kind of uh avoidance with okay. that uh because i of i i mean other than not wanting to dm because i'm scared uh, but even that, it's just a fear, uh, and you have to face your fears. So eventually, uh, I've been talking about DM in a game. Um, right. You want to accomplish it. Yeah. It's an accomplishment you want to yeah. have. Yeah, that uh, makes sense. Yeah, I, I see your point about just casting that net wider, ultimately being good for the game. Absolutely. I hope that people then aspire to in-person games, that they understand, oh, this is a cool way to start out with this AI DM, mm -hmm. get my feet wet, learn the rules. Um that could be good for the game if it does indeed funnel people into the game. We have seen things like this, though. A lot of people are criticizing Hasbro for not capitalizing on the D&D movie, not capitalizing enough on the 50th anniversary to bring mm. in new... They've said almost nothing about it this year. There's, there hasn't been a lot of outreach to get new people into the game. Right. They don't seem that concerned about Baldur's Gate 3. Huge hit. No real tie-in product. There was one adventure, I think Descent into Avernus was like a prequel adventure for yeah, the video game. Yep. That was a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. When the game came out, nothing. Not like they did with Stranger Things. With Stranger Things, they had a box set, learn how to play D&D &D, with the Stranger Things thing on the cover, and it was about right. the Demogorgon. That was great. They took We're that not seeing that stuff. They took other IPs that they have, like Magic the Gathering, and made They did do that. And yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. They crossed... 
uh, they yeah. cross. Um, sort of they did cross promotion. Baldur's Gate uh, through Magic the Gathering as well. Oh, I see. Yeah. But yeah. They, and they have cross promoted D&D into Magic with the universes beyond. Right. Having like the, the Forgotten Realms uh, set, things like yeah, that. And they've, they've done the opposite with bringing Magic into D&D as well. With, with mixed Izzet results and yeah. all things like that, people but don't seem to like the Strixhaven campaign book. From what I've heard, I don't know why. I don't think people like the Strixhaven campaign or like set the either. setting, the, yeah. just the set. Oh, uh, but I mean, but they seem to have stopped doing this stuff back into D and D, right? And so my concern is everything's going to be resting on them trying to convert those digital players into in person players. Mm-hmm. And will Hasbro care? It's not going to do anything for the revenue to do that. No. So it might not be worth the effort. Other than maybe selling some books, some paper copy books, which we've talked about before. Yeah. And yeah. I think they're obviously pushing away from beyond yes. collectors. Uh, we talked about that in uh, one of our videos, uh, the the firing when they fired the book team. Hasbro fires the book team. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I think it's still bringing people to this hobby. And I think that... I th- People probably got a little scared with Magic the Gathering brought out MTG Arena. And you could get all these cards for free. Mm. Why would you ever play paper again? True. Uh, because there's a certain aspect of the socialization that comes with that. That's true. That will always yeah. bring people from the digital, I think, back to the original, the paper game. That's an excellent point. That's a really excellent point. I will say Hasbro does, not to negate your point, yeah. but just to put a little context... Hasbro does, though, still promote pre-releases yeah. in paper yeah, and yeah. tournaments in paper. And they know that's good for that game, but that's because that game is a freaking cash cow. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? D&D, it might be different. I just, I don't know that they're going to promote tabletop D&D the way that they still try to promote tabletop uh, magic. And I don't think that they will. I think you're right that they probably won't promote it as yeah. much. But you think uh, there'll be a similar to, crossover. Yeah, I think there's still... Uh, I don't think it's going to go away. I mean, it, it may true. turn more digital in that you may have more people using Roll20 or the virtual tabletop and being That's still online. tabletop gaming, though. Yeah, but, I mean, it that kind of virtualness uh, but still togetherness kind of happened during the pandemic when true. everything shut down and everybody was using uh, what was the conference? Zoom. Zoom. Uh, everybody was Zooming and just hanging out on Zoom. Yeah. Uh, you may see more pushes with that uh, and, and making it easier for people across the country to get together. Sure. Uh, and use the AI DM if there's not a DM that they have available. Uh, but I think that it's still pushing people towards the game. In That's some fair. Way. And that brings uh, me to it, start playing. I, I take your point because plenty of people will be feeling what I feel when I play magic arena which i play a lot of yeah it's like this is cool but it's missing me playing a person it's mm-hmm. missing the social aspect and i'm not even playing an ai when i'm playing arena i'm playing a faceless stranger and even that's enough for me to be like uh, this is cool and all but i want to play in person right, i yeah. want to get into a store and play again yeah um so that could happen i do wonder about the impact on paid dming i know that paid dming is a controversial topic i have had at least one commenter on this channel frankly call me predatory for talking about in in a video that i did that i started to do paid dming i don't know if most people who complain about that realize the cost alone of being a dm is something most players don't take up i buy a lot more books than a player does i go ahead and pay for the master tier subscription on DD beyond because then i can go ahead and content share with players but guess who buys that digital content a lot of that stuff is built around kind of milking dms oh absolutely it's a huge uh barrier of entry sure and people complain about the cost of games like on start playing an average game is something like 20 dollars per person per session the more uh, experienced DMs there that have a longer track record there can attract more players. Mm-hmm. Get like $30 a session, no problem. Is that expensive for the player? It is. Yeah. I, I get that. Frankly, the games that I run are $20 per person per session, so it's going to cost you about 80 bucks a month to play with me. I would argue, though, you're getting at least 12-plus hours of entertainment out of that. At it's least, still, yeah. still like if you break that down and compare it to paying for going out to a movie or something, and mm-hmm. to me, this is a more premium experience. You're in the movie, and the movie is reacting to what you do. 
And right. it's also, you know, hour per dollar, not that bad of a value prospect, but it is something you do every week, which yeah. you might not do for in-person movies anymore. Some people do. I don't. Yeah. I go once every month, once every few months to go see a movie in the cinema. So That's I get that even though the value prospect might be there, it's still too expensive for most people. But conversely, if we look at it from the DM's point of view and we break down the hourly amount they're making, it ain't much. Right. It ain't much at all. About because five dollars an hour if you're doing a four hour session, or you, if you include prep time, yep. the cost of the books. I pay for the roll twenty yep. subscription. I pay for the D and D Beyond subscription. I pay for content in roll twenty. Uh, by the time you break all that down, yeah, I'm not making much per hour at all. Right now, but but I'm not complaining because that's better than losing money on it, mm -hmm. which is what a DM would normally be doing. Would be losing money on it. Uh, this is great. I enjoy it. I'm just starting to do this. I'd like to make more out of it. But now, if there's this DM, this AI DM that comes along, and they're going to couch it as free, like they're doing with D&D Beyond Maps, I'm sure they'll put it in D&D Beyond, and it'll be like, well, you have to have a certain level. It's not really free, right? Because you, the free subscription right. won't get it for you, and maybe the first tier won't get it for you. It's going to be one of the bigger tiers, like Master Tier. Um, right, yeah. So now you're going to pay for a more expensive subscription to D&D Beyond instead of a human DM. And I, I worry that that will eliminate that possibility for people. I know there are a lot of players who would be like, boo-hoo, because, again, they think that paid DMs that were predatory. At least somebody. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. I mean, all I'm saying is I understand some people won't be sympathetic toward that. But, hey, man, if you ever have a shot at doing something you really love and enjoy and you can make money off of it, yeah. it's a great feeling. That could go away for a lot of us. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I did that with my own self and my day job. Uh, I turned a hobby into something that's paying yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, but I think that the fear of uh, hurting paid DMing, it's going to definitely hurt a little bit. Uh, I think it will definitely uh, kind of similarly to the expansion in the brewing industry. That's what I do. There are tons of breweries uh, and there are like maybe not tons of paid DMs, but there's a lot of people. Oh, that no, there like are to a do lot. It. Yeah, there are a lot. Um, yeah. Probably more than there eventually, are eventually, honestly, uh, with the input of other things in the, the industry, it forces everybody to either do better or leave the industry. So, Yes, you may have to end up, uh, it, it may be a higher premium, but you may get a significantly better experience with a paid DM than you would through an AI DM. So then right. it causes everybody that is in the industry to do better. I don't know about everybody. Well, I think it's either do better or fail at it and not make any money. This is similar to the discussions around AI art. Yeah. People make that argument about AI art a lot, which is like, oh, hey, just be a better artist. But we go from a world where there was a high quality product available for a reasonable amount for people that could mm -hmm. afford it to where now there's less and only the premium thing is available. It's like you can only buy the gold toilet. Right? And then there are only so many people that make gold. This is a weird metaphor, but just go with me. Only so many makers of gold toilets I used to have, you know, there used to be thousands of people, whatever. This is this metaphor is breaking down rapidly. Yes, very quickly. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying. If it pushes a lot of people out who are having a decent livelihood mm -hmm. and the customers were happy, and again, by lowering the bar of what people expect, I worry that it's just bad for the game experience overall. People who begin, we're also speaking as people who began with in-person games, yeah, absolutely. speculating about this entering our world. Let's imagine a world five years from now where this is the norm and you have most people who are experiencing the game. Look, arbitrarily, I'll say for the sake of argument, it experiences another boom like it did a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And everybody's talking about D&D &D and it's, I don't know, in TV shows or whatever, immersive, interactive videos it's people watch at the time. Every TV show now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not just a couple TV well, shows. And, it's and in every TV I'm show. I'm also saying they might not be TV shows anymore. They might be your virtual reality headset immersive experience yeah. that responds to what you're doing. And holy crap, then you don't need RPGs anymore at all. I've just come uh, full circle. <laughs> we're, again. We're more than five years away from what yeah. I just described. Yeah. But not super far. If Have you seen that dinosaur video on the Vision Pro? It's insane. <laughs> I put up my finger and a little dragonfly came down and landed on it. That's, it was amazing. Yeah. I haven't played with it. So. Um, anyway, uh, 
Like you can get a free demo at Apple too, by the way. It's quite an experience. What I'm saying is that people may not be aware that there's another kind of experience if they never grew up with anything else. Because the examples you and I can relate to, like Arena, came mm. after we had played card right. games in person. And this will come after we've, especially in my case, I've spent decades on and off playing role-playing games and running role-playing games. So it's going to enter a context I already have. If you grow up without it, you know, if you, your first exposure to D&D is, oh, mm -hmm. it's this cool robot game and you can play with these uh, androids that are like you. And like, oh, if that's all you know, you have no idea what the possibility is because your barrier is here, right? Um, not barrier. Your entry is here. Mm -hmm. And if it's fun enough and you're not aware that it can be better, it's kind of like how, you know, people talk about how the system is causing beginning, honestly, I think beginning with Gen X, but much more with millennials and younger Get them used to making less money. Get them used to getting less value. Get them used to not having a lot of selection at brick and mortar stores. They don't know what they're missing. I miss YouTube world. <laughs> I miss going to several different clothing stores in a mall, trying stuff on, having a bunch of options. I can't do that anymore, but I know that that's better. And I very much want it. But the convenience, we talked about this during prep. This was the big word, convenience. Yeah. Yeah. Will the convenience factor push down the quality that you get from what is now a standard experience, even if it's over the internet, which is an in-person game. I think the, you know, I finally came up with a good comparison. The brick and mortar comparison is a good one. Most people are going to go shop at Walmart and it's okay that things might be kind of difficult to return. It's okay that they don't have a relationship with the owner of that Walmart. They don't want that. And at this point, people don't realize that that's better Lower price and convenience seem to win in the system that we have. And in the same way that big box stores and internet stores have pushed out wonderful specialty niche local retail spots, I worry about that for this game. I wonder if a similar thing will happen. Maybe it won't. Because having said all of that, or maybe we'll go through a cycle. Having said all of that, I'm now hearing younger people say the same things that I say about internet shopping fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, price fatigue walmarts aren't cheap anymore anyway nothing is cheap no, anymore no. right so maybe there will eventually maybe uh, you're kind of hinting at in some of your other comments maybe there's a little bit of a kind of market correction period maybe right. it is yeah. bad for a yeah, little while yeah i think there's always going to be a market correction period right sure. right uh i do think like you said yeah younger generations uh you know or whatever they're at now uh whatever they're calling themselves x y zoomers yeah, I, I have no I idea know. I can't, what is, I, what's the newest one? I don't know. Z I, is the last Z one that I'm aware of. They're getting older the now, Zennials, too. The Zennials, maybe. Uh, <laughs> but well, the, Z is the last letter in the alphabet. You can't have a generation after Z. Double A. <laughs> Thinking like a gamer. I love it. That was some game mechanics thinking. Yeah. That's a game designer yeah, yeah. kind of observation. Um, but anyway. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. Generation Double A. When people start <laughs> using this, you will know that Ryan coined the phrase. Yeah, Totally. Uh, anyway, I think that you see them start to go back to retro. Uh, and I think that there will be a push again for retro gaming. Physical that, media is a good physical, example. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the return of physical media, people talking so much now, I want DVDs, I want paper books. Right. I have them. I can resell them. You cannot wipe them from my collection. Yeah. yeah. But I think you look at that, uh, there's a number of industries that you see recycling of old things coming back mm -hmm. into vogue uh true enough the entire old school renaissance in yeah. rpgs yeah uh, you've got also you look at music vinyl came back into vogue very true for some reason cassettes came back into vogue now that we kind of talked about a little bit doom and gloom with everything <laughs> uh, i think one really good thing that could come out of this ai uh, push is just dm tools Sure. Ways to make DMing easier for the people that want to do it. Sure. Um, even if it's so small as like a list of quick prompts for a game idea uh, that, you know, we've talked about uh, in your DMing video, you talked about putting questions. Uh, yeah. You watched helping, that video? That I was did, a long yeah. one. <laughs> uh, I, I'm trying to figure out how to DM and anything that's going to help me, uh, I want to get my hands on. Helping to answer those questions maybe is a good way that an AI tool could help uh, or helping generate those questions. 
Uh, if you're having a writer's block situation and you just need a quick story prompt uh, for your players that makes sense into what your campaign's kind of doing, that could help. Uh, Possibly. Quick map generation. I know you don't like that idea we talked about earlier. Uh, I, I like it and I don't like it for lots of reasons, but yeah, I'm not entirely against that per se. I'd still rather go and give something to an independent creator. Even in cases like that, uh, I would rather give something to an independent creator. There are uh, several independent map creators who are quite popular and you can buy map bundles from them for not too much money. And I mean, you got to pay for chat GPT mm -hmm. if you really want to use it. If you want to get the most out of it and use it the most frequently, it's not free. I would rather give that money to an independent creator. And, you know, on that topic, in addition to maps, there are also lots of things on drive through RPG that are of the type of thing you're talking about. Like, here's some adventure prompts. Mm -hmm. Here's some little encounters that you can put into anything. I still rather give that money to a human being who is doing something with it and getting something out of it. However... I don't disagree with you in the most general sense. I'm nitpicking a little bit, but I don't really disagree with you. Yeah, I'm just coming up with ideas of yeah, what yeah, it could yeah. be. Yeah. Of course. Where I especially see it helping is teaching someone how to DM, giving them training wheels. Yeah. So it's it's noticing what they're doing and saying, you could throw in an encounter here, or you could do this. You could I don't I'm not an AI, so I don't know what it would say. Yeah, no, I have like, absolutely you know, no idea. What would I do if I were side coaching a DM? You know, I wouldn't because I'd be talking to them in front of the players, which would make them look bad. Or, which is weird. But or uh, uh you know rules you have a debate between player and dm and the ai is like well here's the rule that's kind of an enhanced search yeah. that's the way that a lot of people right. use but that chat could be, gpt now yeah that could be mm -hmm. a way that ai works that's an ai sure. tool anything where uh, it's responding to what you're doing yeah. dynamically i could see it being useful mm -hmm. for static stuff i'm a little crustier about wanting to patronize human beings over ai first sure. but but Again, that's me picking a nit. Like, the, generally what you're saying, I agree with. If there are tools that can assist people getting into it that, that are training wheels, and the training wheels can come off at some mm -hmm. point. Or the, the, this metaphor breaks down to, like, they're tiny training wheels, I guess. They stick yeah. around, but you use them less and less, and they're just there for you as an option in a mm -hmm. pinch. I do see a lot of promise there. It's the training guide. Yeah, the interactive training sim. Yeah. It's, it's the holodeck for DMs. Right? Maybe. Um, I just blew my own mind because you could... Do a hollow deck if you're in the Star Trek world where you are playing D and D. I think like, that's the point at which D and D dies is when we have hollow decks. <laughs> wow, well, uh, because a bigger then question. it's just LARPing. Uh, yeah. Well, LARPing hasn't killed tabletop role playing either. Yeah, but I think it's LARPing in a different way. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I think that I think there's promise for it. I I do. Me personally. I get a little uncomfortable. I understand why people sometimes shrug and say, hey, you can't stop it. This is where things are going. Maybe it'll be a market correction. I get it, but it's a question of where we draw the line. And right now as a society, we're not really drawing one anywhere. That's true. All jobs will eventually disappear due to automation. True. It'll so, be like Wally. -E. And this is a, yeah, and this is a bigger question. At what point does this become not just, and I'm speaking much larger than gaming AI, because this is still something we do for fun. Mm -hmm. In the long run, yeah. we are not talking about the price of tea, right? Right. We're not talking about, that's a, that's a dated metaphor. We're, we're not talking about the price of lunch. We're talking about something we choose to spend money on for fun, which isn't as serious, but it's just another one of these things where, okay, we can argue that if the barriers removed for producing products because people who couldn't, let's say AI art, that's mm -hmm. a big topic in RPGs now. I'm not an artist. And right now the value prospect isn't very good for me to pay artists to do an illustration every other page in a book, which I think is about the standard. Um, but my book will look more professional. If I do that, it'll look more finished, much cheaper for me to do that with something like mid journey. Um, so people make this argument, but what if, that's going to employ people who print books or that's going to generate revenue for uh, drive through RPG. If there's more of that, there's more people working for drive through RPG. Doesn't it eventually create jobs? Yeah. One thing in isolation, if nothing else ever got automated, sure. Mm -hmm. But they're coming for all those jobs. There's no question, right? Yeah. People with I think all of the money are coming for all those jobs because they would rather not pay for human labor because human labor costs more. Yeah, the, I mean, that's the age-old adage that uh, any industrialization over history has had. Uh, that's fair. This machine is coming to take our job. That's, but they keep doing it, though. Right. That but trend keeps going up. That is, 
not that I'm saying I necessarily agree with AI art and things like that. It is a reduction of jobs in a certain field will always happen with technological advance. Right. The question is what we do about it. Right. Uh, it, but new jobs will always spring forward with that technological advance. What? I, yes. In a sense. But if the arc is up and most types of jobs are eliminated by automation, then what? Well, isn't the goal of everybody to not work? But we are in a consumer-based... <laughs> the entire economy yeah, would no, have I to know. change, and yes. I, I don't think it will. Yeah, it becomes a Not completely different world at that point. A whole uh, lot more people are going to starve is, yeah. before that happens. Yeah, I mean, this is way off of what we're asking about. This is way future, and... It is, but it's something to think about when we think about these things. Yeah. What I'm saying is, yes, we can make the argument that for the next five years, say, this won't be horrible, maybe, but maybe it will. Mm -hmm. I don't know. All I know is I, I look around and I see creative fields shrinking because of industry, even if it's not automation, Spotify and streaming. The, the expectation that music should be free and musicians should provide pro quality, completely yeah. professionally recorded, performed, mixed, mastered <laughs> audio it all, for it nothing all comes down to is how killing the music industry. Yeah. It really is. It's not getting better in music. And I don't see more jobs being created from that either. Right. Uh, and now we'll have AI generated music that no one has created and then people get for very little money. Technology isn't necessarily inherently bad. It is how that technology is used. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. It's it's what we're doing with LLMs. It's a I mean we're at the end of the day we're talking about a game. This right. is a game. Uh and the game will develop the way it develops. I don't think that at the end of the day, everything is going to be, hey, we don't play in paper anymore. Uh, I mean, we don't use paper for most things anymore. It's mostly sure. we use our tools that are given to us. Uh, the the D and D Beyond, you can create characters for free. You don't use your paper stuff anymore. Yeah, but it's still a tabletop um, game. Yeah, uh, but there's it's changed, and that's what this game will continue to do is develop and change over time given new tools and new technology that has been presented. Yeah. It's how the companies that have created that technology or adopted that technology and then the consumer base in which now consumes that technology, how we respond to it. That's true. If we don't want to see AI take over our game and have AI DMs, then don't use it. That's true. Yeah, you make some good points that um, points out to me maybe what I'm really thinking is not that the technology is a problem. It's in the hands of Hasbro. That's what I'm worried about. Yeah. Not that it exists, but in the hands of Hasbro and what Hasbro will choose to do with it in order to push that convenience value prospect, which is going to be a much bigger moneymaker for them than the labor of love kind of thing where RPGs were born. Mm -hmm. uh, but also to that point, this thing tends to cause independent publishers to flourish. And I do feel like, now that we're talking about it, I think indie publishers will always be with us. Cubicle 7, Free League, um, and Paizo being the, the biggest yeah. indie publisher, almost not an indie publisher, but kind of are, um, are still around. Yep. The mass popularity of D and D, as much as people complain about it, sometimes some of the more gatekeeper people, frankly, in the RPG world, will complain about the influx of new players from the popularity of D and D. Uh, that did not have a negative impact, even though a lot of those players didn't convert into RPG enthusiasts. They're still just D and D enthusiasts. They yeah. may not even be aware that other games exist. Right. Nonetheless. While that didn't grow indie gaming to a super huge extent, it still probably had a net good effect, but not a huge effect. And people complained about that. The fact is it didn't kill it off. Those businesses seem to be thriving. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like those small publishers are going anywhere. When I say small publishers, this is all a question of scale. I'm still talking about pretty big publishers compared to... Yeah. This is like talking you about know, craft brewing. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> this is like press. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like comparing like a Revolution Brewing, which is a, a really big local brewer around us. They're more of a regional brewer. They're yeah. not even local, really. To like a, a brew pub, which is a real labor of love and yeah. really quality small batch stuff. Yep. Like, I'm still talking about the... Um, 
the big craft brewers of the RPG world. You're, when I yeah, mentioned the founders, yeah, the, companies. The Bells. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like Bells or yeah. That may have just given you region where we're at. <laughs> That's right. We are we are in the heart of the Midwest, yeah. the middle Midwest, too, yeah. not the upper or lower Midwest, right smack in the middle. Yeah. What I'm saying is that those things are still flourishing. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think this will hurt them. If this happens, it may actually help them. Right. I People mean, might flee to those publishers that are more committed to those things. Exactly. I think, again, uh, I think that the creation of this new technology and pushing this new technology into new tools and ways to play the game isn't necessarily bad, but there's always, I think, going to be a push for in-person, pen and paper, tabletop The real gaming. experience. The real experience. Now, That's true. again, D&D may honestly push completely away from that, uh, and, and Wizard of the Coast may turn into a completely digital, not-in-person thing. Yeah. Well, and the CEO has said they want to be a software company. They basically want to be a software yeah. company. But that leaves still open hundreds of other games to start playing. Sure. Uh, so and once D&D &D, yeah, D &D becomes this juggernaut in the digital space, it may bring people to this hobby. Then understanding, oh, that I've gotten the digital version of this. What's the real thing like? Yeah. What's the in-person thing like? Yeah. I think this also leads towards what we were talking about earlier with the paid DMs and things like that. Paid DMs just may not run D&D &D anymore. That's fair. Yeah. That is overwhelmingly what is run like on start playing. Like, yeah. Whenever I think about but, spinning something else up there, which I'd rather do, D&D as a system is okay. I like other systems better. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I shy away from it because it's hard to get players. But... Um, that doesn't mean it'll stay that way. Right. The the BRP system, we just did the video about yeah. the, the whole thing that they're trying to develop new games. Yeah, that's, so, that's Chaosium. They're yeah, Chaosium. one of the largest indie publishers. Yeah, I'm yeah. not calling them small, but they're not from Hasbro. Chaosium, you may see tons of new published games uh, right. that they're trying to push right now. Yeah, so, and that's a great transition into something that I also think is hopeful for us. I have my annoyances with certain stereotypical kind of RPG players, I guess, who doesn't. Mm -hmm. But that's really a small number of people. The community is generally pretty good. And what we saw with the OGL thing, the Pinkerton thing, and the layoff thing last year from Hasbro, I think that that surprised Hasbro as a corporate entity. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the people in the biggest chairs at Hasbro, right? right? Yeah. The corner office people at Hasbro probably were like, well, this doesn't happen when we screw around with Monopoly. Not the same kind of game. People are not generally as passionate about Monopoly or even Transformers, dare I say it, because those toys were doing poorly. That's another reason that they didn't have a good couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, toy sales were in the toilet. <laughs> but that's what they're used to. You know, mass market retail is what they're used to. Yeah. Technically, in terms of numbers, yes, d and is mass market. But... In terms of its fan base, it isn't thought of that way. It's something people are passionate about. And I think it really surprised them when people said, all right, they're worried about subscriptions. They're worried about D&D &D Beyond subscriptions. This is their biggest moneymaker. Wasn't even an organized campaign right. to have people cancel that subscription. But, I mean, everything we know sure looks like Hasbro responded to Absolutely. that. That They felt that pain, and I think they were surprised by it. Like, what? Usually consumers are our bitches. Like, what? We put our thumb down and they right. take it. Well, and and even compared to collectible card gaming, I'm not saying anything bad about TCG people because they're passionate too, but I don't know if they have the same kind of identity with it that RPG gamers have where they're like, not in my hobby. Hell no. That's not going to happen yeah. in my hobby. That also could save us from these shenanigans because I make the, the comparison to streaming and the difficulty the music industry is having. Your general music consumer is not your typical RPG consumer. General music no. consumer may not care how the sausage is made. RPG gamers, by and large, we do care about how the sausage is made. And we do sit up in, in the so-called blogosphere and now in the YouTube world, which I think these days is an even bigger influencer right, yeah. than blogs. We talk about it and we say, hell no. Yeah. Have you heard of these other games? Well, <laughs> and, and I kind of made a point earlier about uh, if you don't like it, don't use it. Uh, yeah. That was kind of what I was talking about mm -hmm. with... Uh, the OGL debacle and how everybody started canceling subscriptions to D&D yeah. &D Beyond. Not permanently, if, but... 
you don't yeah. agree with the use of AI in these ways, don't use it, don't pay mm -hmm. for it. Yeah. And if they start seeing a loss in money with these things, it, they'll go away. Um, whether good or bad for the, uh, the hobby or not. Right. Um, these things won't expand into things you won't like. Yeah. They're at a real tipping point as a company. They have made some money off of D&D since they acquired Watsi. But to make it at the scale that they need to make to make their investors yeah. happy, they're at a tipping point. It'll be interesting to see how this goes. I could see them steering it somewhere good if they get better than they've been with these things lately. Mm -hmm. Um, I could see them steering it somewhere good. I could see them steering it somewhere completely tone deaf and horrible because they still don't understand their customer when we're talking about their tabletop RPG gaming customer. They think we want to become computer gamers. Some of us really don't. Or some no. of us, well, I am a computer but gamer, I say, but I don't go to that. There's there's yeah. a difference between board games and tabletop versus computers. Yeah. Do do I play video games all the time? Yes, I am a gamer. <laughs> yeah, I play them a lot too. Uh do I also have a huge love for board games on tabletop? Absolutely. They're different things in my mind. Yes, that's true. They're different entities. Uh, would I love to play uh, more D&D &D as a digital game? Yeah, probably. Uh, I mean, Boulder's Gate was awesome. Uh, would I like to play with a, a an AI DM if I can't find a DM in, locally? Uh Totally. That sounds so unfun to me. Uh, I mean, I would try I it. I would try it and see what happens. But I've also had experience with the game outside of that. So I know how much more fun it is to get around the table with four or five of your best friends and drink and have bullshit happening throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, just playing this thing and having fun and playing make-believe uh, like I did as a child and using my imagination uh, yeah, that's, that's a different draw for me. I'm going to make a weird comparison, but I think it kind of works. Uh, it's like the thing with AI romance simulators. This is not going to kill out dating. It is not no. the same. No, it might be an interesting little thing to, to toy around with for the hell of it. For some to practice. That's actually fair. <laughs> Practice your game. Some, <laughs> some people are really awkward and don't know how to talk, but yeah, I don't know. In the same way, like I'm not scared of AI romance taking over human relationships. And maybe I should have the same attitude about AI co-players. Mm -hmm. It'll be a thing. Will it be the same thing for most people? Maybe it absolutely won't. And people intuitively pick up on that. Like, eh, this is okay, but... I just thought of something else I hadn't thought of before either in terms of uh, learning tools or ways to develop your skills as a game master. If I play test, I'm yeah. somebody who loves to homebrew stuff. If I play test a monster with four AI players, uh, I'm not going to get four people in the real world to play test as frequently as I would AI right. players. Yeah. And no, they're not going to think of things at least the way, uh, and we're really talking about LLMs again, not AI. <laughs> Right. True AI doesn't exist yet. Right. But in the same way that LLMs can give you initial ideas right now or point you in a certain direction, um, there could be value there. It's, yeah. not, it's not the same as playtesting with real people, but it's something. Yeah. I, I think that's an interesting outworking of it as well. Yeah. Uh, and I, I mean, uh, another DM tool that I kind of thought out was to help build a monster. Um, I know there are tools for it now, but mm -hmm. to help populate those stats or things Make like that just like yeah it may tell you that like help balance it if it because it's going to know the rules yeah. so much better balancing things could right. be used ai right. could be used for balancing encounters sure or you get new monsters yeah or new classes or things like that that That's you true. have these ideas for um but you have a hard time without play testing balancing these things yeah they could be ai balance yeah and i will say too i absolutely would if i were going to kickstart a supplement which i plan to try to get into in the next year or two starting to do stuff like that by the time it reaches a customer's hands i want real human play to i would still reach out and do that and make sure that real people had played the game and real people had run the game even if i began with a simulation with yeah. simulated players yeah um, to get me to that point it doesn't mean i'm not gonna i absolutely am gonna do that right? well real people will always break everything yeah, <laughs> yeah. when it comes to testing, that's yeah. even better. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. 
Yeah. Well, that was a lot of thoughts about what could happen with AI. Yeah. Uh, we'd love to know your thoughts. This is a polarizing topic. Yeah. Certainly uh, a very hot topic. We're interested in what you have to say. Um, leave comments for that. Also, check out our video. I'm going to drop it in a card below here right at the end where we talk about what happened when Hasbro laid off its uh, book development staff. Not editors, not writers, but people who see through the production of physical books. We talked about AI a bit in that video yep. as yep, well. Absolutely. And there's more content in there that might be interesting to you. Yeah. So check it out.